2018 came and went. The time has come to pay tribute to the games that left the greatest impression on me. I think it's fair to say 2018 had a lot in store. From generation-defining AAA releases like Red Dead Redemption 2 and God of War and indie darlings like Celeste, to unpolished and insulting cash grabs like The Quiet Man, Sea of Thieves and Bethesda's ultimate low point, Fallout 76. This year had a lot to offer, from catastrophically awful to stunningly beautiful. Despite still being cringy as hell, the Game Awards have become consistently better throughout the last years. And ultimately, I stay behind the idea of an annual celebration of the game medium. As flawed as it currently is, it's nice to have our own version of the Oscars. Fuck the Oscars! Fuck you! I'll tell you! But who needs Jeff Keighley when you can listen to Arnold Schwarzenegger's take on the games industry? As far as my personal taste in games is concerned, 2018 was one of the best years in a long while. We saw plenty of story-driven single-player experiences with great production value. Putting my personal preference aside, it's undeniable that last year was a damn good year for video games. 2017 featured fantastic games across a multitude of genres. The launch of two new consoles in the form of Nintendo Switch and Xbox One X, as well as unexpected reinventions of old established franchises like Resident Evil, Assassin's Creed and Zelda. Japanese game developers rose from the ashes and influenced the Western gaming market like they haven't done in a long while, thanks to titles like Zelda Breath of the Wild, Mario Odyssey, Nier Automata, Neo, Persona 5 and Resident Evil 7. I'd argue that overall 2017 was the better and more eventful year. That is not to say this year was short of amazing games, quite the opposite. It was incredibly difficult to keep up with 2018's best new releases. My game backlog has been growing substantially this year. Despite my best intentions, I couldn't bring myself to pick up Capcom's highly acclaimed Monster Hunter. I've always been intrigued by the Monster Hunter franchise, but its restriction to handheld consoles kept me at distance. Monster Hunter World finally opened up the franchise to a greater audience. As much as the concept of Monster Hunter World speaks to me, the game's complex systems and grind-heavy gameplay loop demand a lot of commitment from the player. In a year full of 100 hour long AAA releases, I simply haven't found the time to do so. But my plan still stands. As an admirer of Studio Ghibli's work, I kept a watchful eye on Nino Kony 2. Unfortunately, I haven't even played the first one. I intend to rectify my mistake as soon as possible, since the colorful and magical world of Nino Kuni should be right up my alley. I've heard nothing but good things about this year's indie darling Celeste. I'm afraid it's yet another fantastic game that has to wait a little while longer. You may also be surprised to find out that I haven't played Detroit Become Human. To be perfectly honest, I've grown tired of David Cage games. I'm still trying to recover from the narrative mess that was beyond two souls. I'll give it a chance eventually, but not right now. Don't be disappointed or offended when your personal favorite didn't make the list. The six games you're about to see aren't selected by a Metacritic score, commercial success or popular trends. This is a completely subjective list based on nothing but my personal highlights. I'm also aware of the fact that a top 10 list is the usual way of doing it, but I won't include games I sort of like just to meet the requirements of a top 10 list. Without further ado, here are my favorite games of 2018. Please enjoy.
Way Out story is full of clichés, moments that are straight rip-offs of famous movie scenes, stereotypical characters, and you can't shake off the overall impression that Joseph Ferris was desperately trying to cram as many genres, action scenes and environments in one game as possible, even if it results in a convoluted plot. In short, the story is a hot mess. In addition, the gameplay mechanics are extremely simplistic and never evolve beyond their initial simplicity in order to work in the wide variety of situations the game throws at you. So why has it earned a spot on my list? The answer is fairly simple. I respect the game for its commitment to revitalize couch co-op. It's quite unusual to release a story-driven game whose entire structure is dependent on cooperative play in 2018. Despite its undemanding gameplay and messy story, A Way Out is free of nasty business models and studio interference. You may not like the end result, but this game is the unfiltered vision of one man who delivered on his promise to focus his efforts entirely on a memorable couch co-op experience. You don't have to buy two copies, f*** this one. You only buy one copy and you invite your friend to play with you for free. I mean the entire game for free, for real. A Way Out might very well be the best thing EA has done in the last couple of years. It's the one bright spot on EA's pitch-dark reputation. If you play the game like the developers intended, on your couch with a friend or a family member, and you can find a way to embrace the cringy and ludicrous story, you can have a hell of a good time. My brother and I finished the entire game in one sitting and were laughing our asses off. We need more couch corp adventures like A Way Out. They are criminally underrepresented in the modern gaming industry. This game is far from great, but it's a new IP and offers a very unique experience. And I respect the efforts of Joseph Ferris and Hayslight to make something you haven't already played a couple of hundred times. Relax, man, I got this. The first Spyro games belong to my earliest video game memories. Spyro established the humorous, light-hearted and colorful style Insomniac's games are known for. To revisit the tiny purple fire starter 20 years after his first appearance felt like a cozy blanket of pure nostalgia. The Reignited trilogy is exactly the type of comfort food I needed. After slashing my way through God of War and exploring the vastness of Reddit's enormous open world, the old-fashioned collect-a-thon platforming of Spyro feels like meditation after a stressful workday. Toys for Bob has done a fantastic job of capturing the appeal of Insomniac's originals, while bringing the graphical fidelity and detail of Spyro's universe to modern-day standards. We've seen a large number of laudable remakes this generation, and the Spyro Reignited trilogy is one of them. That's me, all right. If Spyro represents the origins of Insomniac, Spider-Man represents everything the studio has learned over the last 20 years. The game combines the fast-paced and intuitive traversal system of Sunset Overdrive with Ratchet & Clank's great variety of gadgets and self-conscious humor, as well as the bright color palette of Spyro. Insomniac and Spider-Man are a match made in heaven. They were the perfect developer for the job, and this is coming from someone who isn't all that involved in the current superhero hype. Traversing Manhattan is incredible, and it never felt more satisfying to get from point A to B in an open world game. 
The web swinging is Spider-Man's greatest achievement. Even after 50 hours of playtime, I had to force myself to avert my attention to games other than Spider-Man, all because of the addictive traversal. To my surprise, apart from the minute-to-minute -minute gameplay, the characters and story impressed me more than anything else. It's not a flawless story by any means, but holy shit, the writers really nailed the emotional appeal of Spider-Man as a character. The game is not trying to be as gloomy and dark as the DCU, it's still as light-hearted and colorful as you would expect from a Spider-Man story. Even more importantly, the game also knows when to raise the stakes, prioritize emotional impact over funny jokes and apply real consequences to the character's actions. Apart from Dog Ock, many of the villains are boring and one-dimensional. The MJ and Miles stealth sections negatively impact the pacing and not all of the plot twists are as unpredictable as the game wants us to believe. However, the writers took creative liberties and weren't afraid to stay off the beaten path. All the iconic markers are there, but overall this is very much Insomniac's Spider-Man. And not just another origin story. God knows we had enough of those. The most disappointing aspect of Spider-Man is the fact that it copy and paste the ordinary open world blueprint. From activating radio towers to liberating bandit camps and finding collectibles, Spider-Man's open world activities are as unoriginal and unsurprising as it gets. As was to be expected, Spider-Man turned out to be a home run for Sony. So hopefully Insomniac finds a way to address these problems in the inevitable sequel. I'd be remiss not to include Bluepoint's gorgeous remake of a game I admire beyond measure. Shadow of the Colossus has a very special place in my heart, as it taught me much about the artistic potential of video games. My first contact with Team Eco's work goes back to Bluepoint's Eco and Shadow of the Colossus remaster for PlayStation 3, released in 2011. It was love at first sight. Fumito Oeda's imagination and Team Eco's distinctive handwriting are responsible for some of the most memorable and unique artworks the world of games has to offer. Their games are unlike anything else in the gaming industry. As much as I admire Eco and Last Guardian, I still regard Shadow of the Colossus as Team Eco's magnum opus. It's questionable if Ueda will ever be able to create a game as iconic and influential as Shadow of the Colossus. To this day, this game is a prime example for the long-lasting impression of an uncompromised and original artistic vision. Wanderer's quest to find and kill the monumental and awe-inspiring yet harmless colossi conveyed a sense of sadness and melancholy I've never felt since. Even 14 years after its initial release, the game's minimalistic and empty landscape design combined with Otani's beautiful soundtrack creates an atmosphere that is untouched. The moral ambiguity of Shadow's narrative, industry-defining boss fights, impactful sound design, as well as the game's reliance on the active involvement of the player in order to act out its most emotional moments, have been an inspiration for an entire generation of aspiring game developers, including the brainchild of the Dark Souls series, Hidetaka Miyazaki. Bluepoint Games managed to overhaul the graphical fidelity while still maintaining the unique handwriting and spirit of Team Eco's original. Despite the drastic technical changes, it still looks and feels like the Shadow of the Colossus I know and love. Even more, 
The one contentious point many people had with the game has finally been improved. The remake offers four different control schemes, offering alternatives to Team Eco's unusual button layout. If this remake would have been my first contact with Shadow of the Colossus, it would have ended up being my game of the year, hands down. The fact that it still managed to land in the top 3 as a remake of a game I already know in and out should tell you how much I admire Bluepoint's fantastic reimagination of Eco's timeless classic. I'm glad millions of gamers got to experience this masterpiece for the first time thanks to Bluepoint's phenomenal work. Putting the long-awaited sequel to one of my favorite games of all time on the second spot wasn't an easy decision. It was an intense struggle, but one game had to be my number two. After an excruciating eight years of anticipation, I still can't believe that Red Dead Redemption 2 belongs to the past now. Rockstar finally unveiled the tragic fate of Dutch Vanderland's notorious gang of outlaws. Regardless if you agree with the critical acclaim and unprecedented commercial success of Rockstar's Western epos, I think it's fair to say Red Dead 2 was more than a game. Rockstar's popularity and the enormous hype during the years leading up to the game's release made Red Dead 2 an event. The attention to detail and production value at hand is unmatched. Exploring the dense forests, snowy mountaintops and wide open prairies of Red Dead 2 makes you realize just how much effort and money Rockstar put into this game. In many ways, Red Dead Redemption 2 was all I was hoping for. The story of Arthur Morgan and the slow demise of the Vandalin gang fighting against the unstoppable progress of industrialization and modernity is masterfully told. The authenticity and liveliness of the world are beyond anything I've ever seen. The soundtrack belongs to the best I've heard this entire generation. But the game suffers from a major flaw. While Red Dead 2 does so many things exceptionally well, the story missions are incredibly restrictive, forcing you to do everything exactly as the game told you to. And the worst offense has to be the gunplay. I don't understand why Rockstar was able to improve so many aspects so drastically since the first Red Dead, yet still fails to move past the sluggish, unprecise and outright ancient shooting mechanics. In the end, the outdated gunplay cost Red Dead 2 the first spot. It's more than a minor complaint, since shooting accounts for a huge portion of the game. I don't want to go into much detail right now, but I hope once you watched my Red Dead 2 review, you'll understand where I'm coming from. Apart from some of the gameplay aspects, this game definitely sets a new bar for all open world games to come. The long wait is over, and it was totally worth it. This world has its consolation. Sony Santa Monica's drastic reinvention of God of War is by far one of the most engaging and emotional games I've played in years. I always enjoyed the God of War series, but I would be lying if I called it one of my all-time favorites. I'm sure not all are a fan of the direction God of War is taking, and I can't blame you. People who wanted the franchise to stick to its hack and slash roots have every right to be disappointed. However, there's a different side to this story. God of War's willingness to change and bold new direction are exactly what attracted people like me in the first place. One of the greatest achievements is how the game pays respect to God of War's legacy. Despite the radical differences in terms of gameplay and storytelling approach, we are still dealing with the 
the same Kratos. It's not a pure reboot, it is a continuation of Kratos' character. The game had to address the legacy left behind by the previous titles. I can imagine so many ways to either completely ignore God of War's legacy or turn it into shallow easter eggs without substance. Fortunately, the past is not diminished or glossed over. It resides at the very core of the story and drives the dramatic character development of Kratos. This game features hands down one of the best moments I've ever seen in a video game. If you want to know what moment I'm talking about and why I think it's so brilliant, you can find a link to an in-depth analysis video I did in the comments section and description below. It's a journey that explores themes like grief, the responsibility of being a god and the acceptance of past mistakes. The game handles the juxtaposition of action-packed set pieces and intimate character moments exceptionally well. God of War is a game that pushes boundaries and represents the very best video games have to offer in almost every single aspect. That's the reason why I placed God of War over Red Dead 2. In my opinion, the gameplay component of God of War is just as good as the other aspects of the game, which isn't the case in Red Dead. That is not to say God of War's combat is flawless, believe me, there's room for improvement. But all in all, it's one of the most satisfying combat systems I've played in years. If Santa Monica takes criticism seriously and makes improvements to the few flaws left, the sequel could be as close to a perfect game as I could hope for. Can you kill something that big? So much for the games of 2018. Let's see what 2019 has in store for us. I have a feeling the best is yet to come.